What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Five Dialogue. My name is Tim. So a while back, I did a tier list of choking techniques in MMA, ways to apply the choke in the sport of mixed martial arts. And I got a bunch of people that asked that I do the same for joint lock submissions. So I'm gonna do that. And the criteria I'm going to use to judge that will be how versatile the technique is, how easy the technique is to apply, how much skill do you need, and how much skill do you need to defend it? How easy is it to defend? So there's a lot of joint locks. I think I got most of them, so enjoy. All right, so here we go with the tier list for joint lock submissions in the sport of MMA. So the very first one that I'm gonna go over, I'm just gonna get this one out of the way immediately, is wrist locks, okay? Now in the sport of MMA, small joint manipulation is illegal. However, I do not believe that wrists are actually considered a small joint. I think when they're talking about small joints, it's like the fingers um, and the toes. You are allowed to ankle lock in MMA, so I assume you are allowed to wrist lock as well. Unfortunately, in MMA you have uh, gloves and you have wraps that go around your hands and wrist. So it is for that reason that it would be very, very difficult to achieve any sort of wrist lock. Even in grappling sports where wrist locks are allowed and you're not wearing any kind of wraps on your hands, it's still pretty difficult to get them. Uh, you really have to have supreme control over the guy's upper body in order to isolate that wrist and be able to effectively manipulate it. So I'm going to put wrist locks down here at F tier. All right, let's go with a lesser known technique. This one, I like to call it a rib crush. It has another very stupid name called the scorpion crush. I have no idea why anyone would call it that because it makes no sense. We have seen it a few times in MMA, a few times in the regional scene. And this picture is actually of some chick doing it in Bellator. And it is a legitimate technique. You basically compress the floating ribs of your opponent. I've only ever seen it done from the guard position. And the person applying it is the person that's on the bottom. The best way to do it is to get double underhooks. And then you grab behind your own legs and you uh, squeeze your legs and your arms together. This chick actually pulled it off with an over under, I think. She has an over hook right there, as you can see. But the problem with it is it is relatively easy to counter. It's kind of extremely painful. And if you get caught in it and you have no idea what it is, you're, you know, you're obviously not gonna know the counter and you're probably gonna tap right away. It just surprises people and it kind of freaks them out because they've never felt anything like that before. But like I said, it is pretty easy to counter. You pretty much just have to twist your body to the side at an angle. It'll alleviate that pressure. Or you could just choose to do nothing and just you know suffer the pain until the guy gets tired and lets go. So like I said, it's pretty easy to counter. It's not very versatile because you can only get it from one position to my knowledge. So I'm gonna put it at D tier. All right, let's go with a technique that everybody who watches MMA or grappling should know, the Kimura lock. All right, it's a type of shoulder lock. Uh, we've seen it from numerous different positions. You can get it from the top position, the bottom position, side control, like a north-south position. You get it while you have somebody in a triangle. You can transition between that triangle, arm bar. It, it's very, very versatile. You can even use it to defend against the single leg. And you can also use it as a defense for when somebody is behind you or has your back in some way. It is somewhat easy to counter, especially when you have some kind of material to hold on to. And in MMA, you are allowed to grab your own shorts. So just doing that can make it very difficult for the person applying it to finish. It is quite a powerful move. And if you set it up correctly, and if you're sneaky with it, it's devastating. Just ask Big Nog here, who is getting his arm completely ripped off by Frank Mir. You see it attempted a lot in MMA, uh, not so much finished, but out of all the submissions that have been successful in MMA, that's probably in the top four or five 
just because it's so simple. So many people have tried to use it. And I think that's where the beauty of it lies is in its simplicity um, that even a white belt or somebody who's only been training for a few weeks can understand it. So for that reason, I am going to put it at A tier for MMA. You know what? Let's get all the shoulder locks out of the way here. Let's go with another shoulder lock, the omoplata. Now, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know that I love me some omoplata. The first video I ever made on YouTube was about the most underutilized technique in MMA, and that is the omoplata. And that is because I think it is a submission that is very, very available in the context of mixed martial arts. You can get it from a lot of different positions. You can get it from the top. You can get it from the bottom. You can use it as a sweep. And that's mostly what you see it as in MMA is guys that go for it and then they use it as a sweep. But I also feel like if fighters were a little bit more educated on how to finish it, we would see the omoplata's percentage go up in MMA. So far, we've only seen a handful of them. Definitely two, maybe maybe three or four in other organizations other than the UFC. It is pretty complicated, which is one of its downfalls. Is It's significantly more complicated than something like a Kimura, and it does essentially the same thing. So a lot of people's arguments is, you know, why would I even bother when I have a more simplified move? But you can kind of get it from different spots and with different setups. That's why I like it. And as far as how easy it is to counter... It's easy to counter in the beginning uh, when you first get the leg over the shoulder. If that guy steps over or rolls through, that's when it's easiest to counter. And that's why you see it used a lot as a sweep because the guy applying it is not, it's not quick enough, not fast enough, or not knowledgeable enough to stop that escape right away. But once you get that arm over the shoulder or at least over one of his legs to stop the roll and to stop the step over, now it becomes much more difficult to counter and you're forced to either posture up or, or do something else. So I love the omoplata. I think it would be great for MMA, but it's not quite top tier yet because of how complicated it is. So I'm going to put the omoplata at B tier. All right. Let's go with the other shoulder lock that we are missing, the Americana or the key lock submission. I have a picture here of John Jones getting the key lock against Vitor Belfort in their fight. Similarly to the Kimura, the Americana is a shoulder lock, but it goes the other way. And, you know, the Omoplata and the Kimura go this way with the wrist down. In this case, the wrist is up. The issue with the Americana is you cannot get it from as many positions as you can get the Kimura from, or even the Omoplata. To my knowledge, the Americana can only be applied from the top position. You can kind of get a half-assed version of it from the bottom, but it's not really the same. And if anybody can cite an example of someone getting an Americana from the bottom, I would be interested to see that. In other words, if you're applying it from the bottom, it should be easy for the guy on top to counter it. But as a submission from the top position, it, it's serious. It's, it's a really good move. John Jones, when he got it against Vitor, he got it from the crucifix position. And that is absolutely the worst spot you want to be in as far as defending the Americana goes. Just like the Kimura, the beauty is in the simplicity. It's one of those techniques that you learn, that you can learn on day one. And even though it's a little less versatile than the omoplata, we have seen more Americanas in MMA than we've seen omoplatas. And because there's so much emphasis on the top position in the sport of MMA, I am going to put Americana up here at A tier, but behind the Kimura. Right, so I lied. There actually is one more shoulder lock that I have to cover in this, and that is the Mir lock. The Mir lock, named after Frank Mir, he got it way back in the day. I forget who the hell he did this to, but it's essentially like a shoulder crank. It, it's it's essentially like an Americana, actually, from the guard position, but your um, grips are completely different. And you kind of just get an overhook on the guy's forearm, and you come underneath it 
underneath his elbow with your forearm and you kind of just twist and crank it and contort your upper body in order to get that leverage that you need. To my knowledge, that is the only time someone has gotten the mirror lock, at least in the UFC. It might have happened a couple times in like Bellator or a regional show or something like that. But I do seem to remember John Jones trying it on Glover Teixeira in their fight. And I think he actually cranked Teixeira's arm or shoulder pretty pretty well to the point where he was um, he was favoring that arm after the fight. And he did it from the clinch position. So that is to say, you can get it from more than one position at least. But overall, it's not the most versatile move. It's a little bit dangerous because if you don't absolutely wrench on it, that other guy's arm is free to punch you in the face because you kind of have to commit both your arms to, to hug it. So you can be punched in the face from there. Um, if you're slippery, the guy can sort of limp arm out. So it is a legitimate technique, but that doesn't mean it's a great technique. So I'm going to put it at D tier. All right, let's go over some leg locks here, baby. Got a lot of leg locks to go over. Let's go over the toe hold with Mr. Frank Mir again. We've got Frank Mir all over the place here. I really like the toe hold. I think it's an excellent technique. It's pretty easy to apply. Basically like you're putting the guy's ankle in an Americana. But just like those simple shoulder locks, it's pretty simple to counter. You can do what's called putting your foot in a boot, which is where you essentially flex your foot and make it very rigid so that it's hard to get a grip on that guy's foot. Even if you're grabbing high up on the toes, like you're supposed to, which is where the technique gets its name from, it's still going to be very hard to bend that guy's foot in such a way because you kind of need his foot to be pointed in order to get your own arm around it and to be able to grab your own wrist. The toe hold is a great counter for somebody who is defending the knee bar. When they lock their legs in a figure four to defend the knee bar, you can attack the other foot that they're, that they're using to create that figure four lock and then you create this dilemma for them. So it's got okay versatility. It's very simple to use, but it's also very simple to counter. So, um, and honestly, we haven't really seen that many of them. So I'm going to put it at a C tier. It's kind of middle of the road right there. All right, let's go over a leg lock that you've probably never heard of if you only watch MMA. It's called the Estima Lock. The Estima Lock is very similar to an outside heel hook, um, and it does pretty much the same thing. It kind of breaks the guy's ankle by turning it to the outside. And right here is an example of what the Estima Lock looks like if you've never seen it before. Now, something you may notice is that this guy in the white gi here doesn't really have that much control over the guy in the blue gi's body, but he doesn't need to. And that's, that's kind of the cool thing about this is it's not set up in a similar way to a lot of the other leg locks. The way this is set up is usually when the guy on bottom is playing some kind of open guard and he puts his feet up on the guy who's standing um, and he may put him on the, on the upper thigh, he may put it on the hip of the guy that's standing up over him, which is essentially how you play open guard. And the guy who's standing is going to overhook that foot and kind of pinch it against his rib cage and then he's gonna crank up on it. So basically what you're doing is you're, you're kind of like getting this guy's ankle into a front headlock or a guillotine. And the reason it's very hard to escape, even though the guy doesn't have any control over your body, is because in order to alleviate the pressure of this, you would essentially have to stand up, which you can't do because you need both of your legs in order to stand up easily and you only have one. And as you're trying to get up on one leg, this guy's cranking on your other leg. So it's, it's really difficult to escape once you're in it. In fact, like I'm not even 100% sure on how to escape it. Like I can, es I can kind of think of an escape in principle of what you would need to do, but I don't know an actual technical escape to it. That doesn't mean there aren't any, I just don't know it. 
And to be honest, I've never needed to know it because nobody's ever attempted to even put me in one of these. They're somewhat rare even in the jujitsu scene. And they would be even more rare in MMA because in MMA, people don't really play open guard like they would in jujitsu. If you're putting your feet on the guy's hips in MMA, then you're more likely to get punched in the face than you would being a steam locked. And to my knowledge, it's, it's never occurred in MMA. So it is technically applicable, but I honestly doubt we'll ever see it. But it is a legitimate move that's somewhat easy to apply and very difficult to escape. So I'm going to put it at D tier. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to put it back here behind all the others. All right. Let's go for another simple leg lock, the Achilles lock, or in other terms, the straight ankle lock. Now, this is another one where it is done on the same side as the outside heel hook, okay? And it is similar to the Estima lock where you're kind of like putting the guy's ankle into a guillotine or a front headlock. And it's usually like the first leg lock you'll learn if you're, if you're learning leg locks because it's it's pretty simple it's pretty simple to apply but if we've learned anything about these simple to apply moves they can also be many of them simple to counter and this one is pretty simple to counter and honestly out of all the leg locks toe holds heel hooks uh what have you it is the most bearable one in terms of pain some guys are beasts at it and they'll break your ankle right away but most of the time you're going to be able to sit in a straight ankle lock for at least a few seconds before you ultimately decide to tap and if you can sit there and bear the pain it's going to make it even easier to escape even without knowing a proper counter to it so i think that the straight ankle lock is good um you got to be careful with it in mma though because the one bad thing about leg locks in general in mma is that you're committing all four of your limbs to attack just one of the other guy's limbs now that's not a big deal in grappling but in mma it's a huge deal because now you can be punched in the face at will by the other person so you need to finish the fight quickly if you commit to that leg lock and when you have a leg lock that's relatively easy to escape and also bear the pain of then uh, you're pretty much asking to get punched in the face so it is good it is legit it has its perks but it also has it's downfalls, so I'm gonna put it at C tier. Now you know what? I'm having second thoughts. Let's put it, let's put it at a low B tier. I'm feeling generous. All right, so I mentioned it a couple times. Let's go over the outside heel hook. And we have a picture here. I think this is this is Cyril Gan's outside heel hook that he got. Outside heel hook is a great technique. It is one of the more common, probably the most common type of uh, leg lock out there. Like I said, you can transition between this and the straight ankle lock. You can go to the toe hold from here and you can pass it over and then go into an inside heel hook from here. So, I mean, all the leg locks are pretty much readily available from uh, some sort of ashigurami type position or tangled legs position. And the outside heel hook is kind of the middle of the road in terms of what sequence of techniques you're going to transition to and from it's not the most complicated technique out there but there are some nuances to it that a lot of people overlook and end up uh, screwing up there's been a lot of outside heel hooks attempted in mma but not nearly as many that have been finished and i don't think that's because it's a low percentage move in the sense that it's really not that worth it to go for I think if your technique is solid and you know exactly how to finish it, you're going to finish it. It's just not enough people have acquired that amount of technique though. And it is somewhat easy to escape from. You can roll out of it. Uh, you can just generally fight hands. Yeah, it's, it's just not that hard to escape from. The outside heel hook is very good if it's applied by a very technical person. So it's kind of just skimming the surface here of A tier. I'm going to be nice and put it up at A tier. All right, now let's go with its brethren, the inside heel hook. Now, this is a nasty one. And if you've ever been caught in an inside heel hook, you know that 
like you just have to tap or something's going to get torn. Most of the defense of an inside heel hook is preventative. You don't even want to be caught anywhere near it. And once you do get caught in it, it it's very, very difficult to escape. Like you, you pretty much have to stop it before that guy gets a good bite on it, which is, you know, when he gets his forearm or wrist underneath your ankle. If you wait for your opponent to do that, it's hard, man. It's really hard. You got to turn your knee to the ground. You got to fight hands. And even then it's not easy. It's not as versatile in the sense that it's kind of on the other side of your body than all the other leg locks. Whereas, you know, if I'm going for an attack on your right leg and I'm using my left arm, I'd be going for a straight ankle lock or an, or an outside heel hook or a toe hold. The inside heel hook is on the other side. So that's pretty much all I have when his foot is over here like that. There are a few different things I can do, but usually if your right leg is on my right side, that's what I have is the inside heel hook. That's what I'm going for. So that's somewhat advantageous knowledge of the person trying to defend it. But even still, the inside heel hook is devastating, man. So I'm going to have to put it up at A tier. I'm going to put it behind the shoulder locks, though. All right, now we've got to go over the knee bar, of course. The knee bar is actually pretty successful in MMA already. We have seen more than a handful of knee bars. Unlike all the other leg locks that we've gone over so far, it is a joint lock that attacks the knee joint instead of the ankle, hence the name, obviously. It's not too hard to apply. You can get it from a bunch of different spots. You can roll into it from turtle. You can get it from the top. You can get it from the bottom. In this picture here is one of the most interesting examples of the knee bar. Not only was it nasty as fuck, but this girl got it when she was actually caught in a calf crusher. And we'll go over the calf crusher in a minute. But the fact that you can knee bar the other person when you yourself is caught in a submission, that's just a brutal lesson in the fundamentals of leg locking right there. You got to watch out for your own leg. But in any case, I think that the knee bar is fantastic. But I think that its biggest downfall is that it can be easily countered by twisting your leg or even just simple hand fighting or leg pummeling. So it is somewhat easy to counter. I'm going to put it at B tier, but I'm going to put it above the other two at B tier. All right, we've got a few more leg locks to go over. I just spoke about the calf crusher. Let's talk about that one. We've got Charles Oliveira getting his calf crusher against this poor guy. You can get the calf crusher from a few different spots. You can go for it if the guy is turtled up and you have one hook in. You can get it if the person rolls out of your outside heel hook and then tries to limp leg out. Those are probably the two most common places you're going to see it from. There are like one or two other spots that I'm aware of where you can hit a calf crusher. But other than that, it's, it's somewhat rare to see positionally. So it's not that versatile it's it's on the lower end of versatility it is a little bit more complicated to set up and to actually apply uh, this guy's leg has to be really laced up in between your hips and legs in order to really have the leverage to apply it but because it is a little bit more complicated it is also a little bit complicated to escape from once you're caught in it if this guy locks his hands around your waist, then it, it can be really hard to get out of. Just because by the time they get their arms wrapped around your waist, you're going to be in a lot of pain by that point. So uh, you may not even be willing to fight it from there. So it is a nasty one, um, but it's not that versatile and it's a little bit complicated. So I'm going to give it a very low C tier status. And the last leg lock that we need to talk about is the knee bar from the back. And the proper name for that is the Suolev stretch. This one is a little bit of a banana split slash knee bar at the same time. In fact, I didn't even put banana split in here really. 
which is essentially you're forcing the guy to do a split. In this, you're you're forcing him to do a split, but you're also hyperextending his knee on the one leg. We've seen several of these in MMA so far, at least three um, that I'm aware of. Aljermaine Sterling got one to beat Magomed Sherpov, got another, and that's what I have a picture of here. And then there was one other, I think the guy's name was Danny Roberts, who was actually the first guy to do it in the UFC. I can't remember if we've seen it in Bellator. We've definitely seen it a few times in 1FC. So it is it is common, despite it being a technique you can really only hit from one or two positions. And I think that's really crazy that you have a technique that is so it's just not versatile in terms of like positioning and yet you see it quite often and I think the reason for that is when a guy has your back in the sport of MMA what you're going to see as a counter a lot of times is them trying to throw them over the top which is a legitimate counter if the person is too high up on your back if their hips are towards your shoulder blades rather than your hips then there's a good chance that you can tripod and buck them off of you. But the thing you got to watch out for with that is uh, the transition to the arm bar or the transition to the Suolev stretch. And now that more people know about that technique, it is growing in popularity. And of course, the, the back mount is something that we see constantly in MMA. So although you can only get it from pretty much one position, that position is extremely common in MMA. So that, that one's weird on the versatility spectrum. It's really not that hard to apply. You kind of just lean to one side and grab the guy's leg and extend it. It's really more about timing than anything else. And in terms of escaping it, it can be really, really difficult once it's fully locked in. If you're not flexible at all, I would imagine you're tapping right away. If I get caught in that, I'm tapping right away. Because I'm flexible in some ways, but not in that way. <laughs> I can't do a split. So it is a good move. It's very good for MMA, but only from one spot. And even though that spot is common, I cannot, I can't put it all the way up there, man. I just can't. I'm going to put it at B tier. If I remembered to put the banana splits picture on here, I probably would have put it somewhere on a low C tier, maybe even D tier. All right, let's go with the good old twister. And I got Leonard Garcia getting his spine all contorted by the Korean zombie here. The twister is essentially a neck crank, but it is the most complicated of neck cranks, I would say, in terms of setup. You're only going to get it from a few spots. And unless you're like a 10th planet, you know, fanboy, you're probably not going to know how to really escape it. You know, obviously you got to get that guy's arm off your head if he locks it up. But in the sequences before that, that's really where you want to stop it because it's one of those techniques where once once the guy gets into position, you're going to be in a lot of pain. So the defense is very preventative. You want to stop the guy from getting the one hook. You want to stop him from getting your arm over his head, which is one of the weird things about the twister that needs to be achieved in order to apply it. So it's kind of middle of the road in terms of defense. It's high up there on its complicatedness and it's low on versatility. Similarly to the Suolev stretch, you sort of have the person's back in this, which is a common position in MMA. So I'm going to put it at a very low C tier. All right, let's go over neck cranks in general. And I know there's a whole slew of neck cranks. And when you look at it in that sense, the neck crank is very versatile. There's dozens of different ways that you can orient your arms in order to get a neck crank. You can get it from the bottom, you can get it from the top, you can get it from side control. A lot of times chokes end up being neck cranky, which some people see as a bad thing, but hey, whatever gets the tap. Neck cranks are 100% legal in MMA. However, out of all the joint locks, they are probably, generally speaking, the easiest thing to defend against. It's really just a matter of knowing where to put your head and neck and knowing where to keep the other person's arms. And like I said, some many chokes are 
also neck cranks, but then your defense becomes the defense against the choke, not so much against the neck crank, if that makes sense. In other words, if the guy is going for just a neck crank, the defense can be or is very, very simple. If the guy is going for a choke, then it depends on how easy it might be to defend against it because that guy has the option to go for a choke or a neck crank or both at the same time. So it's it's a little weird. That is just my general rule of thumb. That isn't true for all neck cranks because like I said, there's a lot of them, but generally they're very easy to defend. But based on versatility and the ease of application, I'm going to put neck cranks at C tier and I'm gonna put it above the twister. All right, so the last three I've got down here are all arm submissions. We love arm submissions in MMA. Let's go over the redheaded stepchild of the pack, the bicep crusher. Now, just like the calf crusher, you're only gonna get this from a few spots. The cool thing about the bicep crusher that is unique to it is that you can use either your legs to apply it or your arms to apply it. So here you have an example of a guy using his legs to apply it from the bottom position. And you can get the same type of bicep crusher from the top position. A lot of times you'll end up in the bicep crusher position if you fail on your omoplata attempt and this guy kind of gets his arm halfway out but not fully out, then you have that option. You can also apply it from the crucifix position and the place that you're probably going to see it the most if you were to see it in MMA I think would be if the dude was going for an arm bar you know like your traditional arm bar because at that point you can get the guy's arm in like a figure four rear naked choke essentially and bend that guy's arm over your wrist or forearm and get the bicep crusher that way and I think that's the thing that would make it actually quite good for MMA. It's just for whatever reason, nobody's really figured that out yet. I've seen a lot of that, you know, failed omoplata to bicep crusher positioning, but nobody's actually going for it. But I think once people realize that it's there and it's available, uh, you're going to see more of it. So it is somewhat versatile. It is a little bit difficult to apply in terms of skill if you're using your legs. It's a lot easier to apply if you're using the arm version of it. In terms of defense, it is mostly a pain move, so it can be pretty easy to defend against, kind of like the straight ankle lock, how you can kind of sit in a straight ankle lock and be you know, uncomfortable um, or in slight pain, but you're able to sit there and fight it. So I'm going to put the bicep crusher at a low B tier for MMA. All right, the last two to go over. We've got two different types of arm bars here. And I'm going to call this one the traditional arm bar. And I'm going to call this one the straight arm bar. But that can be a little bit confusing because when you think about it, all arm bars are straight. But usually when we say straight arm bar, we are referring to using your arms and your arms alone to be the fulcrum of the technique. Whereas for the traditional armbar, your hips are the fulcrum of the technique. Let's go over the straight armbar first. You can use it from several different spots. And here we see it from the crucifix position, which is a very common and very dominant position in MMA. You could also just get it from regular side control. You could get it from the bottom from your guard if you're using your shoulder. You can pin someone's arm, like if they have an overhook on you, you can pin it to your shoulder and then use your forearm to press down on their elbow and get it that way. You can also get it from the mount position and you can kind of get it from a standing position like you would a Kimura, but not really because you don't have control over the guy's body in order to like pin him anywhere. I think you could 
like conceivably get it if you were up against the cage, but I've never seen it done. So it's kind of middle of the road in terms of versatility. It's very simple to apply. It's just a simple figure four and uh, you're using your elbow, like I said, to break the elbow joint. It's a little bit easy to defend. The, the most common sequence you're gonna see is Kimura to straight armbar, Kimura to straight armbar. Because if you're caught in a Kimura, one of the simple defenses to get out of it is to straighten your arm out. Well, now that person applying it is going to be incentivized to go now to a straight arm lock. And if you wanna defend against the straight arm lock, then you just got to bend your arm. Okay, so there is a dilemma there where you need to pick your poison. But in terms of how easy it is to defend just the straight arm lock, it's relatively simple. And you don't even need to be skilled in submission defense to really be able to tell that just bending your arm will will get you out of the, the move. So I'm going to be nice and put the straight arm bar at a C tier, but it's going to be low on C tier but not, not that low. Let's put it, let's put it up here above neck cranks. All right. So obviously the last one to go over is the traditional arm bar. And that is going to be at S tier. Ta-da. And we have Demetrius Johnson doing the, uh, you know, the, uh, suplex to midair flying arm bar, you know, that old, that old technique. I get that one all the time, but the traditional arm bar isn't just applied from suplex flying position it is also done from the mount it is done from the guard it is done from side control it's done from so many different spots it is definitely the most versatile out of all of the arm bars it's one of the first moves you learn as a white belt it is part of the fundamental precepts of submission grappling if you consider yourself a submission grappler, there's no way you don't know how to apply an arm bar. And for that reason, I'm going to put it very um, low on the complicated scale. It's, it's not very complicated. You can use it to go for other techniques. Even if one of your uh, legs falls off, you can transition to the other arm. There's so many different ways to go back and forth between a bunch of different upper body submissions and different types of traditional arm bars. It's, it's extremely versatile. Even though there are many ways to defend against the arm bar, I wouldn't say it is really all that defendable. I mean, and it depends on what position you're getting it from. I would say that if you're getting arm barred from a guy that's on the bottom and you're on top, it's a little bit easier to defend. But if the other guy is on top of you applying the arm bar, now it's a lot harder to defend. So it's, it's definitely not easy to defend against, but I wouldn't say it's the hardest thing to defend against, but there's counters to everything. So of course, being the most common joint lock submission in MMA, there's going to be ways to counter it. But like I just said, it is the most common one in MMA because it's so successful. It has a very high success rate in MMA. And for that reason, it deserves nothing less than S tier. So that was my tier list for joint locks in MMA. There's a lot of joint locks out there and I'm sure that I missed a couple of them. If there were any that I missed, be sure to say so in the comments. If you agree with my list uh, or disagree, you can also chime in. Do us a favor and check out our Patreon. We got a lot of good stuff on there and it really helps support the channel. As always, make sure to like and subscribe and thanks so much for watching. Take care.